Table of Contents, Hudson River and Valley All about the Hudson River and Valley With visiting and touring information Geography History Attractions And other points of interest Dr. Sidney Socloff Dr. Sidney 22 at gmail.com 2023 Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloff Zoe Phonemes and Nathan Cole Tove. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.1/ytnavigator. The Hudson River and Valley. Chapter 1 Hudson River and Valley. The Hudson River is a 315 mile 507 kilometers river that flows from north to south through eastern New York State and forms the border between New York City and New Jersey at its mouth before emptying into the Atlantic Ocean. The Hudson flows almost entirely within the state of New York, the exception being its final segment, where it forms the boundary between New York and New Jersey for 21 miles, 34 kilometers, together with the Mohawk River its major tributary. The Hudson forms one of the nation's most important waterways. The river was known to the Mahican, Mohican, Indians as Mohicunic, great waters constantly in motion. This is the Hudson River at Manhattan. The Hudson River is named for Henry Hudson, an Englishman sailing for the Dutch West India Company who explored it in 1609. Henry Hudson, 1570-1611, was an English sea explorer and navigator in the early 17th century. The Dutch West India Company was a trading monopoly chartered by the Dutch government. Henry Hudson's explored the Hudson River as far north as Albany in the Havmeen in 1609 hoping to find the fable Northwest Passage to China. The Hudson River was originally named the Mauritius River, which is claimed to be the name given by Hudson in honor of Prince Maurice of Nassau. Alternatively, it is said to be the name given by 16th century European adventurers, explorers, and fishermen who knew the river as River Mauritius, the River of the Mountains. Early European settlements of the area clustered around the river. The area inspired the Hudson River School of Painting, a sort of early American pastoral idol. Chapter 2 Geography of the Hudson Valley The Hudson originates in several small post-glacial lakes in the Adirondack Mountains near Mount Marcy, 5,344 feet or 1,629 meters, the highest point in New York. Lake Tear of the Clouds is regarded as the source of its main headstream, the Opalescent River. The official source of the Hudson is Lake Tear of the Clouds in the Adirondack Mountains. However, the waterway from the lake is known as Feldspar Brook and the Opalescent River, feeding into the Hudson at Tahoes. The actual Hudson River begins several miles north of Tahoes at Henderson Lake. The Hudson is joined at Troy, north of Albany, by the Mohawk River. It's major tributary. Just south of which the Federal Dam separates the Upper Hudson River Valley from the Louis Hudson River Valley, or simply the Hudson River Valley. South of Troy, the Hudson is tidal and widens and flows south into the Atlantic Ocean between Manhattan Island and the New Jersey Palisades forming New York Harbor, at New York Bay, an arm of the ocean. The Hudson was originally named the North River by the Dutch, who named the Delaware River the South River. This name persists to this day in radio communication among commercial shipping traffic, especially below Tappan Zee in place names such as the North River Sewage Treatment Plant. The English originated the Hudson name. Even though Henry Hudson had found the river while exploring for the Dutch, 
Distances along the Hudson are measured upstream from the battery at the lower tip of Manhattan at mile zero. The lower Hudson is actually a tidal estuary. With tidal influence extending as far as the Federal Dam at Troy at mile 134, where the mean tidal range is 4.7 feet, 1.4 meters. At the rising tide of the ocean, the river flows almost 170 miles, 274 kilometers, upstream. When the tide falls, the waters reverse course and flow back into New York Harbor. Strong tides make parts of New York Harbor difficult and dangerous to navigate. During the winter, ice flows drift south or north, depending upon the tides. The Mahican name of the river, Mahican Natuk, means the river that flows both ways. In a famous experiment, a marked log was dropped into the Hudson at Albany. It took 36 days to reach New York City. The Hudson follows a winding course for its first 108 miles, 174 kilometers, to Hudson Falls. From there it flows, without significant gradient, almost directly south for 200 miles, 320 kilometers, to the battery at the head of Upper New York Bay, at New York City. The lower course of the Hudson, about 150 miles, 240 kilometers, long, occupies a drowned valley that is below sea level. Extending seaward from its mouth for about 200 miles is a deep submarine canyon. So, the Hudson River doesn't really end at New York City. It extends for another 200 miles into the Atlantic. The Hudson is sometimes called, in geological terms, a drowned river. The rising sea levels after the retreat of the Wisconsin glaciation, the most recent ice age, have resulted in a marine incursion that drowned the coastal plain and brought salt water well above the mouth of the river. The deeply eroded old riverbed beyond the current shoreline, the Hudson Canyon, is a rich fishing area. The former riverbed is delineated beneath the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, extending to the edge of the continental shelf. The Hudson Canyon is a submarine canyon that begins from the shallow outlet of New York Harbor at the mouth of the Hudson River and extends out of a 400 nautical miles, 450 miles, or 750 kilometers seaward across the continental shelf. Finally connecting to the deep ocean basin at a depth of 3 to 4 kilometers below sea level. The Hudson is often mistaken for one of the largest rivers in the United States. But it is an estuary throughout most of its length below Troy. The mean freshwater discharge at the river's mouth in New York is approximately 21,400 cubic feet, 606 cubic meters per second to be compared to the Mississippi at 593,000 cubic feet, 606 cubic meters, per second and the Columbia at 265,000 cubic feet, 606 cubic meters, per second. The Hudson and its tributaries, notably the Mohawk River, drain a large area. Parts of the Hudson River form coves such as Weehawken Cove in Hoboken and Weehawken. Facts about the Hudson River Watershed The Hudson River flows from Lake Tier of the Clouds in the Adirondacks through New York Harbor to the mouth of the estuary in New Jersey. The Hudson River is over 325 miles long and from Troy to New York Harbor is a tidal estuary, approximately 153 miles long. The Hudson River Estuary is a drowned river valley that was also partially glacially cut. The Mohican originally called the river the Mohican Natuk, which means great waters in constant motion or, more loosely, river that flows two ways. The Hudson River is as deep as 200 feet in some places and can be as wide as 3.5 miles. More than 206 species of fish live in the river.
The Hudson River watershed drains approximately 13,400 square miles and encompasses 11 major subwatersheds. More than 65 major tributaries flow into the Hudson River, with the Mohawk River as the largest tributary. The Hudson River watershed is home to almost 5 million people. The Hudson River watershed encompasses five states. New York, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Jersey. 93% of the Hudson River watershed lies in New York State. 25% of the Hudson River Basin is used for agriculture. 60% is forested. And 8% is urban. Almost 60% of the water in the watershed is used for commercial or industrial purposes. The Hudson River is one of the most important river systems in the eastern United States. The river begins at Lake Taya of the Clouds in the Adirondack Mountains, running 315 miles to end in New York Harbor. The watershed for the river totals 13,344 square miles, or 28%, of New York State. The river lies almost entirely inside New York State, except near New York City, where the river delineates the border between New York and New Jersey. Notable landmarks on the Hudson include West Point, Vassar College, Bard College, Culinary Institute of America, Marist College, Thayer Hotel at West Point, Bannerman's Castle in the Tappan Zee. More notable landmarks on the Hudson are New Jersey Palisades, Hudson River Island State Park, Hudson Highland State Park, New York Military Academy, Fort Tryon Park, The Cloisters, Liberty State Park and the Stevens Institute of Technology. Notable cities on the Hudson include Troy Albany, Kingston, Poughkeepsie, Glens Falls, Yonkers and New York City. This is the United States Military Academy at West Point. This is Vassar College in Poughkeepsie. This is the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park. This is the Tappan Zee Bridge over the Tappan Zee. This is the New Jersey Palisades. The natural beauty of the Hudson Valley earned the Hudson River the nickname America's Ryan. Being compared to that of the famous 40 mile, 65 kilometers, stretch of Germany's Rhine River Valley between the cities of Bingen and Koblenz. A similar 30 mile, 48 kilometers, Stretch on the east bank of the Hudson has been designated the Hudson River Historic District, a national historic landmark. The Hudson was designated as one of the American Heritage Rivers in 1997. Chapter 3 The Narrows is a tidal strait between the New York City boroughs of Staten Island and Brooklyn and connects the upper and lower sections of New York Bay. The Narrows has long been considered the maritime gateway to New York City and historically has been the most important entrance into the harbor. The Narrows were most likely formed about 6,000 years ago at the end of the last Ice Age. Previously Staten Island and Brooklyn were connected, and the Hudson River emptied into the ocean through the present course of the Raritan River, on a more westerly course through present-day northern New Jersey. A buildup of water in the upper bay allowed the river to break through to form the Narrows as it exists today. The first recorded European entrance into the Narrows was in 1524 by Giovanni da Verrazzano, who set anchor in the strait and was greeted by a group of Lenape, who paddled out to meet him in the strait. In 1964, the Narrows were spanned by the Verrazzano Narrows Bridge the longest suspension bridge in the world at the time, and still the longest suspension bridge in the U.S., by length of the main span. Because the hyphen in the name is often omitted, the strait itself is sometimes erroneously called the Verrazano Narrows. The Hudson River reaches its widest point, 3 miles, 5 kilometers, at Haverstraw Bay, 
between Westchester and Rockland counties, before narrowing again to 0.75 miles, 1.2 kilometers, at its mouth. Haverstraw Bay is a popular destination for recreational boaters and is home to many yacht clubs and marinas, including Croton Yacht Club, Croton Sailing School, and Haverstraw Marina. Chapter 4 The Tappan Zee, or Tappan Sea, is a natural widening of the Hudson River, about 3 miles, 5 kilometers, across at its widest. It stretches about 10 miles, 16 kilometers, along the boundary between Rockland and Westchester counties, downstream from Croton Point to Irvington. The Tappan Zee derives its name from the Tappan Native American subtribe of the Delaw slash Lenny Lenap. Together with the Dutch word Z, meaning a sea or a wide expanse of water, the Tappan Zee is flanked by high steep bluffs of the New Jersey Palisades in the Hudson Valley and forms something of a natural lake on the Hudson about 10 miles 16 kilometers north of Manhattan. Communities along the Tappan Zee include Nyack and Haverstraw on the western side, as well as Austining Terrytown and Croton on Hudson on the eastern side. The Tappan Zee is crossed by the Tappan Zee Bridge. Opened in 1955 and about 3.1 miles 5 kilometers long. Connecting Nyack and Terrytown. On September 14, 1609. The explorer Henry Hudson entered the Tappan Zee while sailing upstream from New York Harbor. At first, Hudson believed the widening of the river indicated that he had found the Northwest Passage. He proceeded upstream as far as present-day Albany before concluding that no such strait existed for the Tappan Zee is mentioned several times in Washington Irving's famous short story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. The tale is set in the vicinity of Terrytown, in the area near Irving's own home at Sunnyside. This is Sunnyside, the residence of Washington Irving. Chapter 5 Transportation on the Hudson River The Hudson River is navigable for a great distance above mile zero at the Battery. The original Erie Canal, opened in 1825 to connect the Hudson with Lake Erie, emptied into the Hudson at the city of Albany's Basin, just three miles, five kilometers, south of the Federal Dam in Troy, at mile 134. The Erie Canal and Hudson River enabled shipping between cities on the Great Lakes and Europe via the Atlantic Ocean. Navigational improvements began in 1797, and in 1892 the Hudson was declared a federal government waterway. The depth is controlled at 27 feet 8 meters at Albany and 14 feet 4 meters from Albany north to the Mohawk River. The river is open and navigable to Albany year-round for ocean-going ships and from early May to mid-November to the Great Lakes via the canalized Mohawk and the New York State Canal System for pleasure boat and tugboat barge traffic. Riverborne cargo includes wood pulp, steel, grain, and scrap metal. Passenger traffic has been replaced by parallel rail and highway facilities. Numerous bridges cross the river, including, from north to south, the Castle de Non Hudson, built 1959, the Rip Van Winkle, 1935, the Newberg Beacon, 1963, the Beer Mountain, 1924, the Tappan Zee, 1956, and the George Washington Bridge, 1931. Vehicular and railway tunnels connect New York City to northern New Jersey. In the early 1800s, it was proposed that a canal be dug from the Hudson River near Albany, through the Mohawk River Valley to Lake Erie. As the original part of New York City, 
Manhattan Island offered an excellent port for seagoing vessels in the age of sailing ships. This was first because of the protected waters of New York Bay beyond the Narrows. Where the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is today. This is the Verrazano Narrows Bridge looking back into the New York Harbor. Secondly, both the North and East Rivers are tidal in nature. Flowing in one direction as the tide comes in, and reversing direction as the tide goes out. This made it easier for sailing vessels to come into the port regardless of wind conditions. All of this was carved out during the last ice age that ended some 10,000 to 20,000 years ago. This is the area of North America covered by ice during the last ice age. Note that the glaciers extend down to the present location of New York City. The ice shaped the present rivers and bays around the city. Evidence of the glaciers reaching New York City and their retreat is this large glacial erratic in Central Park. In the 1880s the Hudson was a very busy river with many steamboats. The East River is a tidal strait in New York City connecting Upper New York Bay on its south end to Long Island Sound on its north end. It separates Long Island, including the boroughs of Queens and Brooklyn from the island of Manhattan and the Bronx in reference to its connection to Long Island Sound. It was once also known as the Sound River. Chapter 6 The New York State Canal System The opening of three canals during the 19th century, the Erie, the Delaware and Hudson, and the Champlain, linked the river with the Great Lakes and Delaware and Lower St. Lawrence River Valleys. It was thus a key factor in the growth of the Midwest as well as the Hudson and Mohawk Valleys, as well as New York City. These canals opened the Hudson Valley and New York City to commerce with the Midwest and Great Lakes regions. However, in the mid-20th century, many of the industrial towns went into decline. An important early canal was the Delaware and Hudson Canal, which went from the Hudson River at Kingston southwest to the coal fields of northeastern Pennsylvania. The Delaware and Hudson Canal was completed in 1828, just three years after the Erie Canal. This is a view of the Delaware and Hudson Canal. The New York State Canal System, formerly known as the New York State Barge Canal, is a successor to the Erie Canal and the Fe Canals within New York. The present New York State Canal System runs into the Hudson River north of Troy and uses the Federal Dam as the Lock 1 and natural waterways whenever possible. Currently, the 525 mile, 845 kilometers, New York State Canal System is composed of the Erie Canal, the Oswego Canal, the Cayuga Seneca Canal, and the Champlain Canal. The Erie Canal connects the Hudson River to Lake Erie. The Cayuga Seneca Canal connects Seneca Lake and Cayuga Lake to the Erie Canal. The Oswego Canal connects the Erie Canal to Lake Ontario and the Champlain Canal connects the Hudson River to Lake Champlain. In 1903 the New York State Legislature authorized the construction of the New York State Barge Canal as the improvement of the Erie, the Oswego, the Champlain, and the Cayuga and Seneca Canals. In 1905, construction of the Barge Canal began, which was completed in 1918 at a cost of $96.7 million. The Barge Canal's new route took advantage of rivers such as the Mohawk Oswego Seneca Genesee and Clyde Rivers that the original Erie Canal builders had avoided, thus bypassing some major cities formerly on the route, such as Syracuse, Poweva, particularly in western New York State. The canal system uses the same but enlarged channel as the original Erie Canal. Since the 1970s, the state has ceased modernizing the system due to the shift to truck transport. 
The canal is preserved primarily for historical and recreational purposes. Today, very few commercial vessels use the canal. It is mainly used by private pleasure boats, although it also serves as a supply of fresh water and as a method of controlling floods. Since 1992, the Barge Canal is no longer known by that name. Individual canals in the New York State Canal System, formerly collectively known as the Barge Canal, are now referred to by their original names Erie Canal, Oswego Canal, Cayuga Seneca Canal, and Champlain Canal. Today, the system's canals are 12 feet, 4 meters, deep, 120 feet wide, with 57 electrically operated locks, and can accommodate vessels up to 2,000 tons, 1800 metric tons. The canal system is open for navigation generally from early May through mid-October Bay with opening and closing dates dependent on weather conditions and water levels. Financial support for the canal system is from tolls collected on the New York State Thruway. In northern Troy, the Champlain Canal splits from the Erie Canal and continues north along the west side of the Hudson and then up to Lake Champlain. From Lake Champlain, boats can continue north into Canada to the St. Lawrence Seaway. The Oswego Canal connects the Erie Canal to Lake Ontario. This shows the Erie Canal, Cayuga Seneca Canal, Oswego Canal, and the Champlain Canal. Chapter 7 Steamboats on the Hudson The first commercially successful steamship of the paddle steamer design, the North River Steamboat, later known as the Clermont, operated on the Hudson River between New York City and Albany starting in 1807. Practical steam navigation was begun by inventor and engineer Robert Fulton in 1807, and the river quickly became a major commercial route. The main towns along its lower course owed their early prosperity to the whaling trade, and later in the 19th century, they became home ports for interoceanic fleets. The Clermont was neither the first steamboat built, nor even the first to be operated in scheduled service. But she was the start of the first long-lasting and financially successful steamboat business. The Clermont was the product of wealthy investor and politician Robert Livingston, 1746-1813, and the inventor and entrepreneur Robert Fulton. The Clermont made the 150-mile trip from New York City to Albany against the Hudson River Current in only 32 hours. Steamboats mostly carry passengers but could also carry freight. Steamboats became an essential part of the U.S. economy. Before steamboats, traders on the Mississippi would float cargo downriver. But only occasionally and at a great cost. Would they pull cargo up on barges? This is a Hudson River Steamboat. Chapter 8 Railroads Along the Hudson The Hudson Valley also proved attractive for railroads once technology progressed to the point where it was feasible to construct the required bridges of tributaries. The Mohawk and Hudson Railroad was chartered in 1826 to connect the Mohawk River up to Connectivity to the Hudson River and Albany. It provided a way for freight and especially passengers to avoid the extensive and time-consuming locks on the Erie Canal between Schenectady and Albany. The Mohawk and Hudson opened in 1831 and changed its name to the Albany and Schenectady Railroad in 1847. The first railroad in New York, the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad, opened in 1831 between Albany and Schenectady on the Mohawk River, enabling passengers to bypass the slowest part of the Erie Canal. 
The 3.5-ton Dewitt Clinton hauled five stagecoach bodies on railroad wheels at 25 miles per hour on the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad between Albany and Schenectady. In 1866 the Hudson River Bridge opened over the river at Albany, enabling through traffic between the Hudson River Railroad and the New York Central Railroad west to Buffalo. Various railroads were consolidated into the New York Central Railroad by Cornelius Vanderbilt and became one of the largest railroads in the country. The Hudson is crossed at numerous points by bridges, tunnels, and ferries. The width of the lower Hudson River required major feats of engineering to cross. The results today are visible in the Verrazano Narrows and George Washington Bridges, as well as the Lincoln and Holland Tunnels, Port Authority Trans Hudson, Oat Path, and Pennsylvania Railroad Tubes. The Troy Waterford Bridge at Waterford was the first bridge over the Hudson, opened in 1809. The Rensselaer and Saratoga Railroad was chartered in 1832 and opened in 1835, including the Green Island Bridge, the first bridge over the Hudson south of the Federal Dam. Chapter 9 The Hudson River Valley The Hudson Valley refers to the Valley of the Hudson River and its adjacent communities in New York State. Generally from northern Westchester County northward to the cities of Albany and Troy. Historically a cradle of European settlement in the northeastern United States and a strategic battleground in colonial wars. It now consists of suburbs of the metropolitan area of New York City at its southern end, extending into the rural territory, including exurbs farther north. This shows the counties of the Hudson Valley. Geographically, the Hudson Valley could refer to all areas along the Hudson River, including Bergen County, New Jersey. However, this definition is not commonly used, and the Tappan Zee Bridge is often considered the southern limit of the area. At the time of the arrival of the first Europeans in the 17th century, the area of Hudson Valley was inhabited primarily by the Algonquin-speaking Mohican and Muncie Native American people, known collectively as River Indians. The Hudson Valley area was explored and settled primarily by the Dutch who claimed the area they called New Nederland or New Netherlands. These are the European colonies in North America in 1650. The Dutch West India Company was a company formed by Dutch merchants that had a trade monopoly in the Dutch possessions in the Americas, which included Brazil and the Caribbean. This included not just New Amsterdam, but the entire large territory of New Netherland that had been claimed by the Dutch. This is New Netherland from 1616 to 1664. Note the boundary between the Dutch and English settlements. Fort Orange Dutch, Fort Orange was the first permanent Dutch settlement in New Netherland and was on the site of the present-day city of Albany. Fort Orange was a replacement for Fort Nassau, which had been built on nearby Castle Island in the Hudson River and which served as a trading post until 1617 or 1618, when it was abandoned due to frequent flooding. Both forts were named in honor of the Dutch House of Orange Nassau. Chapter 10 New Amsterdam This lower tip of Manhattan with Wall Street as its northern boundary was the area of the original Dutch settlement of New York City, then called New Amsterdam. Note that this southern tip of the island has been increased in area since those days by landfills. The Dutch first settled here in 1624. A fort called Fort Amsterdam was built at the southern tip of the Manhattan Island. From the very beginning, this was a cosmopolitan commercial town. New Amsterdam was a company town, owned, operated, and controlled by the Dutch West India Company. Here is New Amsterdam around 1650. 
during the rest of the 1600s. The Hudson Valley formed the heart of the New Netherland colony operations, with the New Amsterdam settlement on Manhattan serving as a post for supplies and defense of the upriver operations. In the Treaty of Westminster, 1674, following a war between Britain and the Netherlands, the Dutch were forced to cede their possession of New Netherland to Britain. In the Treaty of Westminster, 1674, following a war between Britain and the Netherlands, the Dutch were forced to cede their possession of New Netherland to Britain. Chapter 11 The Hudson Valley in the Revolutionary War, 1776-1783 The Hudson Valley became one of the major regions of conflict during the American Revolution. Part of the early strategy of the British was to sever the colonies in two by maintaining control of the river. Once the New England colonies were separated from the other colonies, the war would be brought to a swift conclusion. The Hudson River was a strategic waterway during the American Revolution. It was the scene of numerous battles, including the battles at Ticonderoga, Oriskany, and the decisive American victory at Saratoga. Benedict Arnold the American military commander of forts in the Tappan Zee area escaped to a British ship anchored near the village of Garrison after his discovery as a traitor. George Washington made his headquarters at Newburgh, along the West Bank, in 1782 and later disbanded the American armies from Fay. In August 1776, the British forces under General William Howe on Staten Island undertook an amphibious operation across the Narrows and landed in Brooklyn, where they routed Washington's army at the Battle of Long Island. The British plan was for Howe to send a fleet up the Hudson to meet Jen Burgoyne coming south from Canada by way of Lake Champlain and Lieutenant Colonel St. Ledger coming east along the Mohawk Valley. How was to send a fleet up the Hudson to meet Burgoyne coming south from Canada by way of Lake Champlain and St. Leger coming east along the Mohawk Valley. St. Leger was to march east along the Mohawk Valley to meet Burgoyne and how. Burgoyne was to march south from Canada by way of Lake Champlain to meet Howe and St. Leger at the Hudson River. St. Leger was engaged by the American militia at the bloody Battle of Oriskany. He then laid siege to Fort Stanwix. But with the approach of the reinforcements of the Continental Army, gave up and retreated to Canada. The troops that were sent north were delayed by skirmishes along the way and were too late to help Burgoyne. Howe then changed his mind and sent most of his troops south to capture Philadelphia. Burgoyne's march was much delayed by skirmishes and the difficult terrain along the way. The battles we fought 19 days apart on the same ground. 9 miles 14.5 kilometers south of Saratoga. Burgoyne, whose campaign to divide New England from the southern colonies had started well but slowed due to logistical problems. But won a small tactical victory over General Horatio Gates and the Continental Army in the September 19th Battle of Freeman's Farm, at the cost of significant casualties. Lacking help from St. Leger or Howe, he was forced to surrender at the Second Battle of Saratoga. British General John Burgoyne's gains we erased when he again attacked the Americans in the October 7th Battle of Bemis Heights and the Americans captured a portion of the British defences. Burgoyne was therefore compelled to retreat, and his army was surrounded by the much larger American force at Saratoga, forcing him to surrender on October 17. The Battles of Saratoga, sometimes referred to as the Battle of Saratoga, September 19 and October 7, 1777, conclusively decided the fate of British General John Burgoyne's army in the American Revolutionary War and are generally regarded as a turning point in the war. 
This is the map of the Battle of Saratoga on October 7, 1777. This is Timothy Murphy at the Battle of Saratoga October 7, 1777. This is the plan of the Battle of Saratoga. This is the map of the Battle of Saratoga on September 19, 1777. This is the map of the Battle of Saratoga on October 7, 1777. This is Bremen's Redoubt at the Battle of Saratoga. News of Burgoyne's surrender was instrumental in formally bringing France into the war as an American ally. France had previously given supplies, ammunition, and guns. The French formal participation changed the war into a global conflict. Chapter 12 The Great Chain, 1778-1782 The Hudson River's narrow width and sharp turns at West Point created adverse sailing conditions and prompted the construction of the Great Chain in 1778 as an obstacle to the movement of British ships north of West Point. West Point was chosen for the placement of the Great Chain because of the distinctive S-curve the Hudson makes there. This would force any large ship to slow down to navigate it, thus making the ship an easier target for artillery batteries. The name of Fort Arnold was later changed from Arnold to Clinton. In the spring of 1778, the heavy chain supported by huge logs was stretched across the Hudson from West Point to Constitution Island. Opposite. American soldiers positioned the chain to impede the progress of a ship, should it attempt to turn into the east-west channel, against frequently unfavorable winds, and a strong current. Due to the low way Hudson River actually being an estuary. It is subject to significant tidal currents which make navigation by sailing vessels particularly difficult. This is the West Point fortifications from 1778 to 1783, showing the great chain and a separate log boom placed downstream to absorb the momentum of any ship attempting to breach the chain. Cannons were placed in forts and batteries on both sides of the river to destroy the ship as it slowed to a halt against the obstacle. When finally completed, the 600-yard chain contained iron links 2 feet in length and weighed 114 pounds, including swivels, clavaces, and anchors. The chain weighed 65 tons. For buoyancy. 40 foot 12 meters logs we cut into 16 foot 4.9 meters sections waterproofed and joined by fours into rafts fastened with 12 foot 3.7 meters timbers the northern end of the chain was anchored to constitution island and the southern end was secured to a small cove on the western bank of the river both ends of the chain we anchored to log cribs filled with rocks, keeping the ends in place. A system of pulleys, rollers, ropes, and midstream anchors adjusted the chain's tension to overcome the effects of river current and changing tide. Until 1783, the chain was removed each winter and reinstalled each spring to avoid destruction by ice. The Great Egg System of Fortifications at West Point, of which the chain was part, was designed and built by Polish engineer Tadeusz Kosciuszko. It was as commander of the fortifications at West Point that Benedict Arnold committed his infamous act of treason when he attempted to sell the fort to the British. The British never attempted to run the chain. But in the course of his correspondence with the British, Benedict Arnold claimed that a well-loaded ship could break the chain. The main fort at West Point had originally been named after Arnold, but was changed to Fort Clinton after Arnold's betrayal. Chapter 13 Hudson Valley Estates There are many great estates along the Hudson Valley. Here are some of the great estates along this part of the lower Hudson Valley in Ulster and Dutchess counties.
Here are some of the great estates along this part of the Middle Hudson Valley in Green and Columbia counties. This is a map of the estates in the Hudson River Valley. This shows the location of the estates in the Lower Hudson Valley from New York City up to Poughkeepsie. This shows the location of the estates in the Middle Hudson Valley from Poughkeepsie up to Kinderhook, 20 miles south of Albany. Born in Kinderhook, Martin Van Buren, the eighth president of the United States, retired to Lindenwald at the end of his presidency. Van Buren purchased an existing estate in 1839 and immediately had it remodeled from the old-fashioned federal style to the popular Italianate revival style. The home and furnishings are restored to their condition during Van Buren's stay there. Lindenwald hosts an extensive museum collection, including textiles furnishings and a large collection of historic wallpaper. This shows the location of the Martin Van Buren House, Linden Wald at Kinderhook. This shows the location of the Martin Van Buren House, Linden Wald at Kinderhook. President Martin Van Buren was nicknamed Old Kinderhook after his birthplace in New York State, and it is thought that this is where the expression OK comes from. Alana was influenced by Church's extensive travel in the Middle East and Europe. Coupled with his aesthetic appreciation of the valley, Alana is a masterpiece of both architecture and landscape. Alana was influenced by Church's extensive travel in the Middle East and Europe. Coupled with his aesthetic appreciation of the valley, Alana is a masterpiece of both architecture and landscape. The grounds reveal attention to the property's stunning natural beauty made even more wondrous with carefully designed landscaping in the Romantic style. Clermont at Germantown has been occupied by seven generations of the influential and affluent Livingston family, including Robert R. Livingston Jr., one of the five men who authored the Declaration of Independence. Livingston swore in George Washington as the new nation's first president. Livingston's first mansion was burned by the British troops advancing up the Hudson in 1775. The home was rebuilt soon after and remodeled in the 1920s to the colonial revival that now stands. Livingston's first mansion was burned by the British troops advancing up the Hudson in 1775. The home was rebuilt soon after and remodeled in the 1920s to the colonial revival that now stands. Montgomery Place and in Daylon Hudson was established from 1804 to 1805 by Janet Livingston Montgomery, widow of revolutionary Wahiro General Richard Montgomery and descendant of the legendary Livingston family. Montgomery Place features elaborate gardens, a restored greenhouse, and an orchard. The interior offers original family furnishings and artworks, artifacts of this great family's history, and an intimate look at the working side of a flourishing estate. Wilderstein at Rhinebeck was built originally in the Italian villa style, but was remodeled in the Queen Anne style in the 1880s. Its circular tower soars five stories above a landscape created by noted American Romantic landscape artist Calvert Vox. The library at Wilderstein has stained glass pieces by Tiffany. The Mills Mansion at Stotsburg is a monument to the Gilded Age of society and wealth at the turn of the last century. It is a legacy of the marriage of Nouveau Rich Ogden Mills and the aristocratic Ruth Livingston. The Mills Mansion is built around an existing inherited mansion in 1895. The 65-room residence showcases Beaux-Arts neoclassical styling and elaborate French and English furnishings. The Mills Mansion is built around an existing inherited mansion in 1895. The 65-room residence showcases Beaux-Arts neoclassical styling and elaborate French and English furnishings. The Vanderbilt Mansion at Hyde Park was built by the third generation of Vanderbilt millionaires. 
This neoclassic style mansion was completed in 1899. Long accustomed to wealth, Frederick Vanderbilt had his home designed by the best architects in New York and furnished it with fabulous artifacts from abroad mixed with period reproductions. The Vanderbilt Mansion offers a great perspective of the wealth and excess of the Gilded Age and one of its most prominent families, America's 32nd President, Franklin D. Roosevelt was born at Springwood in Hyde Park. He lived much of his life here and was buried here after his death in 1945. Franklin D. Roosevelt's mansion, known as Springwood, was built in the Georgian colonial style in the early 1800s, with several renovations since bringing it to its current state. The burial site of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt is graced with a simple monument alongside a lovely rose garden. Formal busts of FDR and contemporary sculptures are tucked into scenic spots throughout the landscape. Also on the site is the FDR Library and Museum, which contains many historic documents and belongings of the president. Val Kill near Hyde Park is the retreat of Eleanor Roosevelt, Built in 1926, this field stone home was to become her sanctuary from the hectic pace of the presidency, as well as refuge from the formality of the main house on the estate. It is part of a group of historical estates that includes Springwood and the Vanderbilt Mansion. Val Kiel's charming Dutch colonial cottage was built for Eleanor Roosevelt on a favorite streamside spot on the Roosevelt estate. Val Kill's charming Dutch colonial cottage was built for Eleanor Roosevelt on a favorite stream's ad spot on the Roosevelt estate. The property includes Eleanor's rose garden, a cutting garden, and a furnished cottage. Historical programs serve to educate visitors about this most influential first lady. Locust's Grove at Poughkeepsie was the home of Samuel F. B. Morse an accomplished artist, an inventor best known for creating both the telegraph and Morse code. In 1847, Morse purchased an estate complete with a Georgian-style mansion he quickly converted to a Tuscan villa. Later owners added to the structure and interiors while striving to preserve its 19th century flavour. The Morse Exhibition Room at Locust Grove features a copy of the original telegraph model. Bosco Bell is an estate overlooking the Hudson River built in the early 19th century by State Stickman. It is considered an outstanding example of the federal style of American architecture. Augmented by Dixman's extensive collection of period decorations and furniture. Today Bosco Bell is a historic house museum and popular tourist attraction. It was originally built in Cruisers, New York in 1804 by States Morris Dixman, a British loyalist who returned to the area after the Revolutionary War was over. When threatened by destruction, this federal domestic style mansion was dismantled, stored, and finally reassembled piece by piece in its current location. The house has since been filled with a comprehensive collection of American federal period antiques and art. The well-appointed grounds include a rose garden with scores of different varieties. The Hudson Valley also was the location of the estates of many wealthy New York industrialists, such as John D. Rockefeller and Frederick William Vanderbilt and of old-moneyed tycoons such as Franklin Roosevelt, who was a descendant of one of the early Dutch families in the region. The Van Cortlandt Minot at Croton on Hudson was purchased by John D. Rockefeller Jr. in the 1940s. Van Cortlandt Minot is preserved as it was in the earliest years of the U.S. Tours of the Minot by costumed guides include many original period furnishings and a remarkably well-preserved kitchen with a traditional beehive oven.
Kiki Yacht at Sleepy Hollow is one of the Rockefeller family homes. Kiki Yacht's imposing granite Georgian mansion rises above a series of stone terraces and formal gardens. The Bow Arts landscape at Kiki Yacht is home to Governor Nelson Rockefeller's extensive collection of 20th century sculpture, which includes works by Calder Picasso and Noguchi. Lindhurst at Terrytown is the Jay Gould estate, with turrets, battlements, and a majestic tower. Lyndhurst stands as a Gothic castle guarding the Hudson. Lyndhurst was commissioned in 1838 by the mayor of New York City, General William Paulding. Subsequent owner George Merritt added a few story to we and the fair additions. Railroad magnate Jay Gould purchased the estate years later, making his own changes to the house and grounds. Now a National Trust historic site, Lyndhurst is surrounded by classic estate landscaping that includes a magnificent greenhouse and aviary. Although Washington Irving immortalized the Hudson Valley in his tales of Sleepy Hollow at Terrytown, he also settled here, in his Dutch plantation-style home, Sunnyside. Sunnyside was built around an existing cottage in 1835. The house evokes the Dutch architecture of his native New York City, but with a fanciful touch. Sunnyside is filled with an eclectic variety of furnishings and decorations, including Irving's intact study complete with his two-sided writing desk. The grounds of Sunnyside are landscaped in the Romantic style, flowing out of the surroundings. The Glenview Mansion at Yonkers is part of the Hudson River Museum of Westchester Complex, which includes the Hudson River Museum and the Andres Planetarium. Glenview, completed in 1877, is recognized as one of the best examples of East Lake interior styling. Visitors can also experience the five galleries of exhibits in the Hudson River Museum and the events at the Andres Planetarium. The Hudson River Museum, established in 1948, has an extensive collection of works from the Hudson River School and features exhibits on the history, science, and heritage of the region. Chapter 14 the Hudson Valley in Art and Literature In the early 1800s, popularized by the stories of Washington Irving, the Hudson Valley gained a reputation as a somewhat Gothic region inhabited by the remnants of the early days of the Dutch colonization of New York. This is a painting of the headless horseman pursuing a kebab crane, 1858, by John Quitter. The natural beauty of the Hudson Valley has earned the Hudson River the nickname America's Ryan, a comparison to the famous 40 miles 65 kilometers stretch of Germany's Rhine River Valley between the cities of Bingen and Koblenz. A similar 30 mile 48 kilometers stretch of the East Bank in Dutchess and Columbia counties has been designated a National Historic Landmark. Chapter 15 The Hudson River School of Art The Hudson Valley area is associated with the Hudson River School, a group of American Romantic painters who worked from about 1830 to 1870. We will next have a short video clip about the Hudson River School movement. We will next have a short video clip about the Hudson River School movement. The Hudson River School was the first native painting movement in the United States and was known for its celebration of the American landscape. Thomas Cole was the founder of the movement and his followers included Frederick Edwin Church, Albert Bierstadt, and Asher B. Durand. Originally he worked as a portrait painter but admired American landscapes by artists such as Thomas Doty. In 1825, this admiration led Cole to New York in search of a landscape painting career. His paintings of the Catskills gained him instant fame and was the start of the Hudson River School movement. Under Cole's influence, the Hudson River School artists focused on the concept of the sublime, which instilled in the viewer feelings of awe and danger that can occur in the presence of nature. 
These artistic efforts give the works a beautiful but haunting air. On display in Gallery 14 is a painting by Thomas Cole entitled Landscape Composition. This painting includes his famous rendering of lush greenery and a luminescent sky. Christopher Pierce Cranch's The Waterfall depicts two Native Americans in a broad landscape with a heavily forested area that disappears into the misty and mysterious background. Both the waterfall and landscape composition emphasize the Hudson River School interest in awe-inspiring scenes of nature. Similarly, Albert Bierstadt painted his work Niagara Falls to appear to Americans who were nostalgic for the original beauty of the land as it was before the Industrial Revolution. Viewers wanted the purity of the land back, and Bierstadt fulfilled this longing in this scene of the untouched land near the falls. Both the waterfall and Niagara Falls depict human figures who are diminutive in comparison to the scene around them, giving viewers a sense of the vastness of the land. Through its presentation of Hudson River School paintings, The Bigs allows viewers to step back in time to see America in its idyllic state before industry changed the natural beauty of these scenes. The Hudson River School was a mid-19th century American art movement by a group of landscape painters whose aesthetic vision was influenced by Romanticism. School, in this sense, refers to a group of people whose outlook, inspiration, output, or style demonstrates a common thread, rather than a learning institution. The name, applied retrospectively, refers to a similarity of intent rather than to a geographic location. Though many of the older members of the group drew inspiration from the picturesque Catskill region north of New York City, through which the Hudson River flows. The artist Thomas Cole is generally acknowledged as the founder of the Hudson River School. Their paintings depict the Hudson River Valley and the surrounding area, as well as the Catskill Mountains. Adirondack Mountains, and White Mountains of New Hampshire, as an outgrowth of the Romantic movement. The Hudson River School was the first native school of painting in the United States. It was strongly nationalistic both in its proud celebration of the natural beauty of the American landscape and in the desire of its artists to become independent of European schools of painting. The early leaders of the Hudson River School were Thomas Doughty. Asher Durand, and Thomas Cole, all of whom worked in the open and painted reverential, carefully observed pictures of untouched wilderness in the Hudson River Valley and nearby locations in New England. Although these painters and most of the others who followed their example studied in Europe at some point, all had first achieved a measure of success at home and had established the common theme of the remoteness and splendor of the American interior. Frederick E. Church was born in 1826, and by 1850 he was the acknowledged master of landscape painting in the United States. Frederick Church was a student of Thomas Cole, the leader of the Hudson River School. Church's paintings are replete with the details of the landscapes he painted, down to their most explicit characteristics. This is the Heart of the Andes, 1859 painted by Frederick Edwin Church. This is the Beaches painted in 1845 by Asher B. Durand, 1796-1886. This is Asher B. Durand's painting of Kindred Spirits an 1849 landscape depicting Thomas Cole, the founder of the Hudson River School of Landscape Painting, and William Cullen Bryant, a journalist who inspired Central Park and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is an Old Man's Reminiscences by Asher B. Durand, 1796-1886. This is High Falls on the Rondout Creek William Ricker B. Miller, 1865. This is about the picturesque by Thomas Locke. This is Crown Est from Bull Hill, Hudson River by W. H. Bartlett in 1837. Chapter 16 Pollution and Urban Sprawl 
Pollution issues affecting the Hudson River include accidental sewage discharges, urban surface runoff, heavy metals, furans, dioxin, pesticides, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Due to the decrease in industry within New York State over the past 40 to 50 years, parts of the Hudson Valley have seen economic decline and unemployment to a greater degree than other areas in the state. Still seen in the valley today are abandoned factories and old buildings that are remnants of a once thriving region that included upscale theaters, lavish homes, resort hotels, and health spas. The numerous factories that at one time lined the Hudson River poured garbage and industrial waste directly into the river. This pollution was not assessed in a comprehensive fashion until the 1970s. By the time, the largest company still operating factories in the area was General Electric which became primarily responsible for cleaning the Hudson River. Though swimming was banned in parts of the river in the early 1960s, the pollution has been steadily declining and, as a result, some municipalities have begun to allow people to swim in it again. The crowding and high cost of living associated with the New York metropolitan area and its adjacent suburbs have led increasing numbers of people to move from these densely populated areas to the Hudson Valley, including parts as far north as Great Poughkeepsie, and commute into New York City to work. This demand for housing has resulted in increased residential development and a significant increase in housing costs in the lower and mid-Hudson Valley regions. Along with this residential development has come commercial development such as shopping malls and other landmarks of suburbia and urban sprawl. Many longtime residents have reacted to this by forming environmental and preservationist groups dedicated to stopping further development. While parts of the valley today struggle with crime and poverty, other parts contain some of the wealthiest and safest communities in the nation such as Westchester and Putnam counties. The overall effect of decreased industrialization and increased residential development has been the transformation of the region, especially in the lower and mid-Hudson Valley to an exurb struggling to balance the competing demands of maintaining the area's rural character with the conveniences and services of suburban living. Chapter 17 Hudson Valley Scenes This is an aerial view of West Point. On the left is West Point and beyond that is Storm King Mountain. This is Storm King Mountain. These are the Palisades on the west bank of the Hudson River. This is the Hudson River from the Bear Mountain Bridge. This is the Hudson River. This is the Hudson River. In 1998, the Hudson River was designated as an American Heritage River. The Hudson was one of 14 rivers nationwide selected for this honor. Recommended videos, Hudson River and Valley. Recommended video, in the galleries, the Hudson River School Movement. Recommended video, the Hudson River School. Recommended video, Hudson River Journeys, The Geology of the River. Recommended video, How the Ice Age Created the Hudson River. Recommended video, Hudson River, Currents in Time. Recommended video, Top 15 Attractions and Things to Do in Hudson River Valley, New York. Recommended video, Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area. Table of Contents, Hudson River and Valley. Thanks for watching. 
Please watch some more of my great videos.